Alhamdulillah, we thank our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the mun'im and the giver of blessings. And we have all these great attributes of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala to get back to this common theme of giving. Our Lord is al kareem He is the generous. He is al basit He is the expander. And He is al wahhab subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the bestower. The bestower who gives his gifts to those who are entirely undeserving of those gifts. And the greatest gift that we've been given is this deen. This deen that our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam came 1400 plus years ago to convey. He conveyed it to the generation of the Sahaba, who conveyed it to the generation of the Tabi'een, who conveyed it to the generation of the Tabi Tabi'een, and it has reached us in unbroken chains to this very day and age. This is something that we can as believers be proud about. Because it is only Islam that has an idea and a concept, rather you could say, of the reality of the initiatic chain. This unbroken chain of transmission back to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam such that we can ascertain with absolute certainty that there are words that our Prophet ﷺ said, that there are teachings that he left behind, that we know exactly the way that he used to pray. We know exactly what he used to say in his prayers, that we know in a very descriptive, detailed, intricate manner, the way that our Prophet used to dress, the way that he speak, the way he remained still, the way that he moved, the way that he dressed, everything about him Wasallam that we have a complete picture about who he was. And his life is one of the greatest tafsirs. It is one of the greatest commentaries on the Book of Allah. And in fact, it is one of the great things that the Muqassar, the commentator who is interpreting the meanings of the Qur'an that he looks at, is that he always has to look at and ground their tafsir in the life of our Prophet Sallallahu So that if we ever find that we might not know what a particular verse means, that we have to look to the life of our Prophet, and that you'll find in great detail the nuances, the nuances of the different ways of understanding the various words of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And alhamdulillah, that our Prophet did not leave us bereft of guidance. And in fact, that he left us upon the mahajjit al He left us upon the white clear road. Laylaha kanahariha. Its night is like its day. La yizig anha illa halik. The only person that will divert from this path is someone that has been damned. Meaning that they've chosen for themselves to go astray. They've chosen for themselves not to accept guidance. Because it's ourselves that are, get ourselves, our own lower souls, which gets in way of guidance. Otherwise, the guidance like the sun, that is shining upon everyone unless there's something blocking those very rays of the sun. This is the default foundational position, unless the person in and of themselves choose otherwise. And so alhamdulillah, one of the great aspects of his guidance is that he left us with teachings that help us to have clarity. Because one of the things about the human being is that if we don't have intellectual and mental clarity, that it's very difficult for us to have orthopraxy or behavior that is in conjunction with that intellectual clarity. And then our Prophet told us about what we would term the alamat al sa'a, the signs of the end of time. And there's a number of signs that our Prophet mentioned to us. And their importance could be established in the very hadith through which we establish the very pillars of the deen, i.e. that of Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. In the famous hadith, this hadith that is one of the four pivotal hadiths around which the entire deen rotates and revolves. And we have a mentioning of the alamat al sa'a and the signs of the end of time in this hadith. And he mentions to us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the two examples of them. But likewise, not only is it important for us to understand the signs, but it's also important for us to understand how we orient ourselves in relation to these signs. And one of the great analogies that has come to us in the prophetic tradition is our Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ By the one 
in whose hand is my soul, the nafs, the soul of Muhammad is in his hands. And the method in mu'mini, like a method in nahla. Indeed, the likeness of the believer is like a bee. The likeness of a believer is like a bee. And then he went on to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, أَكَلَ الطَّيِّبًا فَوَضَى الطَّيِّبًا That he ate from the pure and wholesome things, and then he produced that which was pure and wholesome. فَوَقَعَتْ And when it landed, يعني, when it landed on the petals of the various flowers that it took the pollen from, فَلَمْ تَكْسِرْ وَلَمْ تُفْسِدْ That he didn't break it, the bee didn't break any petals, nor did it corrupt the flower. And this is the hadith, this he, he's giving us in this hadith an analogy. An analogy which indicates a, fire, a higher form of learning. And ultimately everything in the phenomenal world is a metaphor. And that it points to something from the alam al arwah the abode of the soul. And the more spiritually in tune that we come, the more that we will come to understand every single aspect of natural phenomenon that is taking place around us, that we'll be able to connect it to something that is from the higher realm. The more spiritually in tune that we become, spiritually, the L, the, L, the L and the Y at the end is an adverb related to the spirit, the soul, which is a higher form of the existence of the human being. But he's giving us an analogy comparing the believer to a bee. And in another narration that is mentioned by Imam al-Kharaiti, that we have a number of statements that precede this analogy. And what precedes this analogy is our Prophet is putting it in the context of the end of time. And our Prophet said in this other hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the minashrat al sa'ati, indeed, from the signs of the hour, is al fuhsh wa tafahush. Fuhsh is indecency. Tafahush is tekalluf al fuhsh, where someone goes out of their way to become indecent. And these are two phenomena that you see. There's a lot of indecent people around us. It doesn't take, you don't have to look far to find them. But one of the most interesting, in a negative way, phenomena is tafahush, is people going out of their way to be indecent. And if you've ever traveled in so-called third world countries, which oftentimes are much more humane than the so-called first world, but if you look at many of these phenomena, you see them right before your eyes. I remember in places that I've studied that you see someone walking in the middle of the desert in a very remote place far away from anything, that wearing a t-shirt with some you know, terrible looking, I mean, I don't even want to call it a human being, on their, on their shirt. And from the WWE, I guess they call it now, in my days, many of you are older than me, it was WWF, it wasn't as bad then. These were the days of Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant and Junkyard Dog and these type of people. But now if you look at the way that these people look, that they look straight up shaitanic. They look like demons. And what is this individual doing in the middle of a sacred city that wearing something, a symbol of this sort? For them, that they might just be trying to wear the latest thing to impress their friends. But for someone that comes from a culture that understands very well the danger of that. And if you don't believe me, read Chris Hedge's book called The Empire of Illusion. It's one of the great reads that you'll enjoy from beginning to end. Except the chapter on pornography, which I would pass over, except maybe read the intro and that's it. But he talks about the state. And the first chapter deals with this phenomenon. is the way that people have learned to live their lives through people on sitcoms. And these characters that la khalaqa lahum, they have no portion of the akhara, but they live out their own problems through these people and through these storylines that are given to them. But you also see another phenomenon is that as people hasten to be a part of the so called modern world, is that they're tafahash in the sense that they're ready to give up anything in order to be a part of it. And you see these tendencies, especially in people that want to come to this country for solely worldly means. You oftentimes see these tendencies. And that this is something that our Prophet is saying is from the signs of the end of time. But he also says, Wusu al jiwari wa qatar arham. And that bad neighborliness 
and breaking your family ties. These are also two of the signs of the end of time. How many of us even know who our neighbors are? And when was the last time that we even greeted them or did something nice for them or actually cooked for them? <clears throat> that nowadays, if you even try to do something nice, oftentimes they're worried, especially if it's coming from these Muslims who are next door. You don't know what they put in the food. But bad neighborliness, that the traditional scholars took neighborliness very seriously, that your neighbor is, according to the, the, the most lenient opinions, seven houses in either direction, a seven house radius. So north, south, east, west, seven, and draw a circle around it. And that's your, knows your neighbors. Other opinions say 40 houses. And so, especially nowadays, if you're living in a large building, that there is a requirement upon our shoulders to the extent possible that we take this seriously. And cutting family ties, this is one of the worst things. These people are mad'oom. And there's certain people that are distant from the rahmah of Allah. And that if we're asking for Allah's guidance and victory, and we're doing things through which that we are becoming cursed in the sight of God, how do we ever expect to be given victory? But then our Prophet goes on to say, This should have been mentioned a few months back or a few weeks back when people were going out to occupy Oakland. Because one of the signs of the end of time is that the treacherous person will be deemed to be trustworthy. And the trustworthy will be deemed to be treacherous. And so people give their money to people like Bernie Madoff thinking that he's investing it. And it turns out that he's one of the biggest criminals in human history, one of the greatest scams in human history. And that you see these people smiling, and they have a little mark after their name that tells that they've achieved something in the world and that people trust them. And oftentimes that there are wolves in sheep clothing. But this is one of the signs at the end of time, and people that are really trustworthy that they're actually deemed to be the opposite of that. And then our Prophet goes, to, goes on to say that وَأَنَّ مَثَلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And the likeness of a believer. So he mentioned a few signs to contextualize this. And there's a number of others. But our Prophet went on to say is like لَكَ مَثَلَ الْذَهَبِ الْجَيِّدَةِ That the believer is like a good piece of gold. أُقِدَ عَلَيْهَا That it was put to the fire فخلصت, and it became pure. فوزنت, and then when it was weighed, فلم تنقص, that its weight didn't diminish at all. This is the state of the believer. Is that all of the tribulations and trials that we go through, is that it is that trial in and of itself that is necessary to bring out your true nature. ليميز الله الخبيثة من الطيب In order that Allah may distinguish the difference between that which is khabith, is lowly, and that which is tayyib, and that which is pure. And this applies to all of tribulations in our life. Is that the way that you respond to tribulation is indicative of who you are as a person. Whatever that tribulation might be, whether it be in the physical realm, or the intellectual realm, or whatever it might be between you and someone else, or something with your own self. That the way you respond to that is indicative of who you are as a person. And likewise, in the way that we respond to the times in which we live. Because we live in a time, if you haven't yet noticed, it's a time where things are very crazy. We live in a crazy time, without any exaggeration. And our Prophet Sallallahu said him that in, there's a, a few hadith in Sahih Bukhari that talk about this time of fitan and of tribulation. And our Prophet said, you should يُشِكُوا إِنْ يَكُونَ خَيْرَ مَا لِلْمُسْلِمِ غَنَمٌ يَتْبَعُ بِهَا شَعْفَ الْجِبَالِ يَتْبَعُ بِهَا شَعْفَ الْجِبَالِ يَفِرُوا يَفِرُوا مِنْ بِدِينِهِ مَنَ الْفِتْنِ That there's about to come a time that the very best wealth of a Muslim are sheep. That he herds and follows the mountain, the, follows the herbage on the mountain tops. <coughs> And Mawat and Khata, the places where the rain is, that he's fleeing with his deen. This is a hadith of our Prophet. Anyone tells you that you can't flee from fitan, 
that tells that this is in Sahih Bukhari. There's another hadith where our Prophet said that Satakunul Fitan, that there will be tribulations. That al Mashi fiha al Qaid fiha khairun min al Mashi. Al Qaid fiha khairun min al Qaim. The one who's sitting is better than the one who's standing. Wal Qaim khairun min al Mashi. The one who's standing is better than the one who's walking. Wal Mashi khairun min al Sa'i. The one who's walking is better than the one who's rushing to it. Meaning that there's times, of, there's times where there's a lack of clarity. It just says if you drop your ring or something in water, and if you put your hand in immediately, that it might become murky. And then you're not able to, if you would just wait a second and let the water go still, you'd be able to grab your ring. And likewise, there's times where when people hasten to respond to certain things, and they jump on board what everyone else is doing, that you have to look into things carefully and to know where does the maslaha and the benefit lie. Is to actively be involved in this moment or to refrain and position yourself so you know when correctly, when is the correct time to actively be involved. And then our Prophet went on to say, Man tasharrafa laha tastashrifu. That whoever you know, seeks them out in, you know, tasharrafa is to, to uh, a shurfa is a balcony, meaning you're looking out after him as you want to be a part of them. That they will overwhelm him and overtake him. And this is part of the nature of our time is that these fitan that are happening according to the prophetic description. <laughs> like the incessant darkness of night. That every moment of night that comes, it's darker than the moment that comes before. And especially in the globalized world, that we're not only in a state of where we hear tribulations of what is going on around us in our immediate sense, that we hear about everyone else's tribulations as well. And the way that this affects the human being psychologically is very profound. And it's very difficult for human beings to accept reality. One of the most difficult things of all is to accept reality. And to be able to understand reality according to the way that you accept that reality. And this is why Imam Ali bin Abi Talib said, he said, لو كُشِي فِي الْحِجَابِ لَخْتَرْتُ إِلَّا الْوَاقِعِ Were the veil to be removed, I would have only chosen the way that things are. But that takes an arif billah. That takes someone who knows their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that they know their Lord in His majestic manifestations, and they know their Lord in His beautiful manifestations. And it's easier for the human being at first to know Allah through beautiful manifestations. Majestic manifestations are difficult when you go through intense tribulation. I'm taking a class right now in Islam in Bosnia. And when you actually hear about the details, and he's just started to go into the details, about what happened in the mid-90s in Bosnia, and the ethnic cleansing that took place, and the genocide, and what actually happened to our brothers and sisters, elderly and youth, to our Muslim brothers and sisters from Bosnia. And this is going on right now as we speak. Many of you have seen that video that was posted in this past week. This is going on right now as we speak. And this is also one of the signs of the end of time because another hadith of Prophet said that there is going to, that there is going, that, that there indeed from amongst the signs of the end of time, in yuqbad al ilm, that knowledge will be lifted, when takfir al zalazil, that earthquakes will happen often. When you taqara the zaman, the time will become near. I mean, there's no more blessing in time. And also, that what you, with these distances that we're able to travel now, what previously would take months. And then our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went on to say, when, and that, when taqthur al fitan, there will be all kinds of tribulations. When yaqthur al harj, and wa huwa al wa huwa al And that there will be a lot of indiscriminate killing. There'll be a lot of indiscriminate killing. And this is one of the great signs of the end of time. Is that if you look at how many people die regularly, and we don't even think twice about it because you become immune to it oftentimes, is that the amount of indiscriminate killing that takes place. And this is very serious, and people don't realize how serious it is. Muslim and non-Muslim blood, human beings' blood, in particular Muslim blood, and there's an ethel that, that indicates that from the, the, 
the weightiness of the believer in the sight of God, with everyone in the world to get together, to take part in the killing of one soul, one believing soul, that God would throw all of them into the fire, and wouldn't pay any attention to it. Meaning, this is indicative of the horma, the sanctity of a believer, in the sight of God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then our Prophet said, that money will be widespread. But taking this back to understanding this is the first step. And there's only so much that we can say about it in the short time we have together. But the signs of the end of time need to be studied. And they need to be learned. And they need to be memorized. And their meanings need to be applied as well. But our Prophet is saying is despite all of these issues, and all of the signs of the end of time, what is the way that you can position yourself so that you come out as a mu'min? You come out as a believer, truly safe, because iman is from aman, it's from security. There are probably saying that you have to be like pure gold. That when you're put to the test, that you respond. And that you become even more pure. <coughs> that you become even purer. And then in terms of, terms of the be, that relating this to this time of fitr is that what does the bee do? Of all of the possible things that the bee can eat, what does the bee eat? The bee eats the best of all things. It goes to plants, and not only plants, it goes to flowers, and only flowers, it goes to the choice part of the flower where it goes and it takes the pollen from numerous flowers. And what happens is, is that then it synthesizes all of the pollen in its own self. And then, that it produces honey. And honey ultimately is a shifa. Honey is a healing. And that this is the state of the believer. Is that despite the time in which they live, is that they take the best of everything. And one of our teachers said, مَنْ نَظَرِ الْمَحَاسِنِ فَقَدْ جَمْعَ الْمَحَاسِنِ Whoever looks to the good in everything, will gather only that which is good. You have a choice to what you let in your heart. And if you only let good things into your heart, then you will only be good. You have the choice. You can look at, if there's a thousand and one terrible things, and there's one good thing, you can choose to focus on that positive good thing, or you can look at the other thousand bad things. That's your own choice. And God is just, and He's given us freedom of choice. And if you continue to only focus on that which is good, and not only focus on that which is good, but your behavior in extracting that good is such that, like the bee, it doesn't break petals, nor does it corrupt the flower. In your own sense, in your own case as well, is that you don't break things, whether they're related to own aspect, your own aspects of your own life, or whether it relates to your relationships with other people. Because there's some people that are just destructive by their nature. They just break things. They break relationships with people. They break people's hearts. And that it comes from an imbalance. And our Prophet said, <laughs> Those who delve into things are not supposed to are destroyed. Those who delve into things are not supposed to are destroyed. And maintaining that balance and understanding the time in which we live and knowing when to step forward, and when to step back, and when to be active, and when to remain inactive, and what to do in every single situation was related to your work, or home life, or relationship with brother Fulan who's in the masjid, or anyone else that you're dealing with, is that it comes down to a very fine scale. And we have to learn to be nuanced as believers. There's an element of our lives that's black and white, but then there's another element that gets extremely nuanced in terms of how we deal with people. And this requires wisdom. This requires wisdom, and we take wisdom from its source, which the source of all wisdom is the Quran and the teachings of our Prophet and the previous, Quran, the previous scriptural teachings that came before us. And that wisdom that came upon the tongues of the Prophets and righteous that came before us. But this is like the advice of our Prophet is that we be like the beef. And instead of corrupting things, is that we help pollination. Because the bee not only doesn't corrupt, it helps other plants get pollinated as well. But we all have to ask ourselves, is that the very things that we say and do, are we a shifa? 
do we bring about healing in whatever context that it is? Because the nature of a believer is like a bee. That if we're following this prophetic analogy, that our behavior and our words and our actions and our have, our state, it will be a shiva. And it will be a cure. And that we know the pains that people receive in the modern world. People are screaming out in every way possible. Don't be caught up by what exactly they're doing. They're screaming out with their nisan and ha, with mute eloquence, that their state, that it wouldn't speak, this is what it would say. And that we have to be a shifa, and we have to be like the Bidr of Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> أرسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهروا على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون ما بعد يا عباد الله إني مصيكم ونفس إياي كتاب الله الحمد لله that in closing that we have to also recognize is that the khayriya the greatness of the ummah of our prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is not something that is came that came is ended. That our Lord says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, kuntum khayra ummatan, ukhrijat lin nas. That you were the very best ummah. And we'll translate it as community, although it doesn't convey ummah. You were the best community that was brought forth to people. And then it goes on to speak, ta'muruna bin ma'rifuatan, hona al munkar, that you enjoin good and you forbid evil. But Allah ta'ala says that you were the best ummah brought forth to people. It doesn't matter after that whoever says whatever they say. The Lord of the heavens and the earth has said that you are the best ummah. And this is the word of God. And in reality on Yom Al-Qiyamah, that before everyone's eyes, these realities will be crystal clear. And they'll realize why the ummah of our Prophet ﷺ is so great. And then we have to understand that what is the greatest aspect of the greatness of the Prophet's Ummah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Because if you focus on the political realm, or the economic realm, and oftentimes the social realm, and many other types of realms, that you might question how could the Muslim Ummah be the greatest? Look around, look at the dysfunctionality in Muslims in our own community domestically, and then internationally. Look at all the problems that are taking place. But you also have to recognize is that the greatest aspect of this greatness is related to what is taking place here. The transmission of the heart and the reality of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is that the people that are still alive today that are pre pre preserving the true essence of the prophetic inheritance. And the greatest aspect of the prophetic, prophetic inheritance that pertains to spiritual realization internally at the heart level is the fact that we still have today that countless numbers of awliya and salihin and upright, righteous people that are preserving the inner inheritance of our Prophet And we have countless number of peoples as well, as well that are preserving and protecting the prophetic inheritance that relates to ethics, that relates to behavior and character traits is that this is the true inheritance of Rasulullah. And one of the greatest, great aspects of Islam is that it's existed for so many centuries <clears throat> that without a political regime that completely helped them from every aspect. This is from the greatness of Islam. And if, and if you look at this and you recognize what is truly important when it pertains to this, <clears throat> is that you won't be deceived like many of these other people are deceived when they start to question the greatness of the Ummah of our Prophet 
because it still remains. And there's still people that are like this today, that have reached the highest level of taqwa, that are in a state of dhikr, that are remembering their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and their hearts are in the divine presence. For us, the true istifa is being in the divine presence, having your heart be attached to your Lord. It doesn't matter what everyone on earth thinks of you or says about you, as is attested to in a hadith of Sahih Bukhari, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls out to the Archangel Jibreel and tells you, Ya Jibreel, love so and so because I love him. And then Jibreel tells all the angels that are in heaven, love so and so and I love him. Well, you da'na al qabul fit al and he's placed to give an acceptance in the earth. <clears throat> if that's your state and you've been selected in that fashion, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks about you. Our greatness is related to our relationship to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring our hearts to life with knowledge and iman and with the meanings of the, his remembrance subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bless us all to long to be in his presence. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayuha alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad kama sallayta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ala Sayyidina Ibrahim. وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيد إبراهيم وعلى آل سيد إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد ورضي الله تعالى سادة الخلفاء الرشيدين أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وعلى جميع سادة الصحابة الكرام أهل بيته المطهر من رجاس وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات ربنا تقبل منا أنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا أنك أنت التواب الرحيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروا على نعمه يزدكم ونذكر الله أكبر